So molecular self assembly and uh, molecular self assembly is a process by which molecules adopt a defined arrangement without guidance or management from outside source, right? So molecules, uh, most of the molecules are known to self assemble. Some common examples include your lipids. So the particularly the phospholipids, they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. So when you leave them in an aqueous environment, the tails come toward each other and the heads face on the opposite direction forming a double layered uh, liposome, if you remember. We had done this yesterday also, right? And then you have a central hydrophilic core, and then you have on the outside again, an aqueous medium and a hydrophilic uh, outer boundary, right? And then of course, uh, you have a self-assembled tRNA. Uh, RNA is the most common, uh, uh, most common uh, biomolecule that is known to self-fold and arrange into a uh, into a clover leaf model in the secondary structure and into an L shape in the tertiary structure. And then, of course, proteins are known to assemble uh, uh, based on their tertiary and quaternary structure, also their secondary structure, right? And proteins are functional only in their tertiary and quaternary structure because that is when they get the confirmation and that is when the active site is formed. Active site is formed by, more, by actual residues that are far apart from each other in the primary structure but they come together because of the folding of the protein in a special conformation in a 3D space where they can contribute to the chemical qualities of that particular space, allowing for the development of the catalytic site or active site, right? So molecular self-assembly, we've talked of. Biomolecules, DNA, RNA, proteins, and lipids have inherent self-assembly property as is exhibited by self-assembly of lipids to form the membrane, the formation of double helical, DNA through hydrogen bonding. And therefore, of course, you can have uh, self-assembly of DNA if the two strands are complementary. And likewise, proteins can fold over. There are two types of self-assembly. You have intramolecular and you have intermolecular self-assembly. We'll have a look. So here is your liposome. I've already talked of it. So you have a head that is hydrophilic and you have a tail that is hydrophobic. So the two tails orient towards each other. So they are away from water now. And the head, which is hydrophilic, is forming the outer boundary and the inner core, where again, in the center, you have the aqueous medium. So this is your liposome. We had talked of this earlier. And if you remember uh, also, uh, phospholipids are very important part of your, uh, of your plasma membrane. The cell membrane basically is a lipid bilayer. Fluid mosaic model was given by Sanger and Nicholson. So uh, molecular self-assembly of DNA, if you see, so adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine, they come together. And then, of course, there is this phenomenon of nucleic acid hybridization, where two complementary strands running antiparallel to each other would find each other and bind with each other. And the size of this DNA need not be essentially the same. It could be a one longer DNA, DNA like the genomic DNA. And this could be your PCR primer. Primer would be around 18 to 24 bases, right? And genomic DNA, if you're taking human, it would be 3.2 to the power 9 base pairs. Uh, if it is uh, bacterial, it could be around 5 megabases or something, right? So that is the, the whole idea. So nucleic acid hybridization is an example of self-assembly where two strands that are self-complementary and are anti-parallel will find each other and bind to each other, okay? Then, uh, of course, we talked of principle of base complementarity is used in Southern Blot, Northern Blot, CRISPR-Cas. And the answer was all of the above, if you remember. Uh, in all these cases, we are using the principle of self-complementarity or base complementarity between complementary strands, right? So you are using the principle of hybridization uh, for this here. Then we move on, and we talked of this also, molecular self-assembly. The most common example of a nucleic acid folding over itself to form a functional molecule is, is, plus, no, not mRNA, transfer RNA. All right, so we move on. So molecular assembly of proteins, if you see, you have a primary structure, which is basically starting from the amino terminal until the carboxy terminal, the amino acid residues. We call them amino acid residues because you have no water. The, uh, one molecule of water is lost between when a peptide bond is formed. So you have amino acid residues here. Then they would fold into the secondary structure. Secondary structure could either be a alpha helix or a beta sheet and then these would fold further into what is known as the tertiary structure and then two or more polypeptides can come together and again impact each other in terms of folding forming the quaternary structure all of this happens in cell regularly and at all times right this is happening in cell at all times and very regularly 
at nano scale we are only beginning to see this now and notice this now right so therefore uh, cells are basic nano machines by themselves so quaternary structure and then of course for some proteins you may require to have a chaperon which may assist them in folding right? so there are two approaches of making nano structures one is to break down the bulk material into smaller fragments and further smaller fragments into the nano scale and the other is to bring the atoms together cluster them together or molecules together and cluster them so much so that they attain the nano scale size so this is the top down approach this is your bottom up approach right so and both approaches can be used the fabrication of nanometer scale structures uses two different approaches top down or bottom up top down as the name indicates uh, starts from large structure reduces their size to the required dimension and patterns by means of an external assembly tool this is the standard strategy in manufacturing but it becomes increasingly difficult to reach smaller sizes towards the molecular scale so you you do not have enough equipments to handle very small materials so therefore it becomes a bit difficult by contrast the bottom up approach uses the internal information of the molecule to guide their autonomous self assembly into nano structures so what you now want is not the self assembly you want you want it to be a guided assembly so you could want to make a molecule which is able to fold in a predetermined manner that you want not in its own natural affinity of folding but the way you want and uh, we start with a recap and then we talked about how you can use biosensors we talked about menin which is a uh, which is important because this allows you point of care technology for sequencing right which is not possible with other existing technologies that are there um because you use nanos nano pore as a detecting material here it becomes point of care and it becomes very easy for you to take it to the patient also nano pore is the only technology that uses helicase for sequencing dna so basically you unwind a piece of dna pass it through a nano pore and when it is passing through a nano pore which is under current or electric field characteristic fluctuations in current happen each of the four nucleotides give you a different fluctuation and therefore you can record what is the nucleotide that is currently passing through the nanopore that gives you the sequence right class all other technologies will employ a dna polymerase that will synthesize a complementary strand and based on what is getting added which nucleotide is getting added on the complementary strand you will have your sequence deciphered so this is the difference then in transducers i have already told you the first interaction happens between the biological recognition element and the analyte the biological material that you want to test that is the first reaction then this reaction is quantified and converted into an electrical signal by the transducer this is amplified and then displayed all right so this we have done and we have talked why biosensors are why nanobiotechnology is becoming very important in uh, in biosensors because it has higher specificity we have talked of quantum dots earlier it has higher sensitivity again quantum dots are example miniaturization it helps you and uh, bring down the size of the machine to such a small proportions that it can be easily ported from one place to another place therefore uh, it can be used as point of care and greater portability all right so then we move on and we had talked of this in the last lecture also so if you see biomolecules are are known to self assemble since a long time and what we want today in nanotechnology structuring is that we can guide them into take specific structures and functions so there are two ways of assembling biomolecules or nano structures one is the top down approach where you start from the bulk material break it down into fragments and for the fragments giving it the nano scale and stopping the reaction where the nano scale that you want the size that you want is achieved and then the other is where you can start with the atomic level which is the sub nano range cluster them together into the nano range and then again once they are in the nano stay in nano scale range you can stop the aggregation therefore allowing for a specific nano particle of a specific shape and a specific size right so this is your bottom up approach this is a top down approach then of course what we normally do when we do a structuring or when you make a nano structure is we do what is known as a guided assembly where you want to you know curb the natural tendencies of the molecule to to fold the way it would have normally folded and allow it to fold in a very specific formation that you want to guide that you want it to fold it in a particular specific way so what you do is a guided 
uh, assembly and not their autonomous or self assembly is not something that you want right what we want now is can we use biomolecules and legos to create a desired nano machine this desired nano machine will have a specific structure and a specific function is what we want and what do we have as legos in our hand we have four nucleotides which are coming from your dna and then we have 20 different amino acids which come from your proteins and and the advantage with using dna as your uh, starting material is that you know exactly how it is going to fold you can you have a lot of prediction power because you know it is going to follow your base complementarity rule so a pairs with t c pairs with g and therefore given a primary structure of a dna which is the sequence of nucleotides you can very easily predict what is the secondary structure it was it is going to form if it is allowed to self assemble or if it is allowed a guided assembly where you obstruct certain regions from folding using what is known as staples and we'll come to that in a moment then of course you have 20 amino acids and then again you can have a primary structure where you know the sequence of amino acids now to predict how this is going to actually form into a secondary structure tertiary structure and quaternary structure is a lot more difficult because it is not as simple as base complementarity here there are many things that play a role in protein folding and therefore this gets a bit more complicated and therefore you lose your power of prediction here but then of course because you can replace 20 amino acids instead of four for a given length this can give you a higher functionality if you make a protein nanostructure it can have a higher and more diverse functionality as compared to a DNA nanostructure of the same length. So let's say you are making a polymer with 10 units. So for here, you'll have only four nucleotides per position. Here you can have 20 nucleotides per position. So a lot more possible structures can be made here and a lot more primary structures would then give you a lot, of, lot more functionality. But then the important difference here is that you cannot predict how it is going to fold so you cannot really guide the assembly here. The guided assembly is slightly more of a problem with respect to proteins, but a guided assembly is very easily achievable in case of DNA. So biomolecules that can be used for nano assembly, you can have DNA nano assembly, you can have protein nano assembly, and you can have DNA protein hybrid as nano assembly and applications, of course, will look into this.